This is Let's Talk, getting to the root causes of the important issues of the day. This on-the-air community forum believes your voice matters and welcomes all thoughts and views without judgment. Please join today's conversation by calling 415-663-8492. All right, 317, come to that. And your hosts today are... Charles Schultz, hello. Shelley Rugg. Stephen Hurwitz, enjoying this beautiful day. And I'm Paul Riffel, yes. Uh, when you call in to 415-663-8492 or 8317, uh, you'll hear a little buzzy noise as I put you in the system. Just hang on until you hear me say you're on the air, give us your first name, turn your radio down, and please keep the language clean. Be sure to keep the language clean while we talk about... Books. Books. <laughs> <laughs> what about books? You pick books. Why, Mr. Phil? Well, I was hoping you were going to go with procrastination, but Ooh, procrastination. maybe next time. That's for next week. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. Time. Very good. Uh, you, yeah, putting you that did, off. You did if we notice get to it. <laughs> You notice that the blurb about the show Uh just went out yesterday (laughs) afternoon. (laughs) Anyway, uh, well, I'm packing books at the moment, so I have boxes Uh, of books uh, filling filling one room. And uh, you you get to thinking, why have I got all these books? What the heck are they for? And, uh, you know, I haven't read. There's most of them I haven't reread. They're all still sitting on the shelves. Uh, some of them I keep. The ones I'm keeping are the ones that I tend to every so often take down and read again. And uh, other than that, there's a lot of research books for the books that Donna and I wrote. By the way, Seduction Redefined, a wonderful book while we're talking about books. <laughs> available oh. in stores everywhere? Available in stores everywhere if they order it. Or, yes, I'm afraid, online. Oh, or online at our, at our uh, website, seductionredefined.com. But enough about me. <laughs> and, of course, wow. Brain Lines, which was another book that we wrote that's also available. Brain Lines. Watch yes. out. This do is not. A, just a sales Do pitch. not look him straight in the eye. <laughs> this, is, this is a cynical uh, uh, reason to have this call and show. It's simply to sell books. Uh, it's just to get those them. extra books off my counter. Yeah. That's, that's how that works. <laughs> so so uh, and I also read, a, uh, read an article... In, uh, where was this? I think it was The Economist, I think, about the the book business and how it's changing and how, you know, people keep saying, oh, books are a thing of the past. They're going to die out because you can do everything online or digitally, e-books and all that. But it turns out, of course, that books are as popular as ever. They're still making a profit for the big publishers anyway. Mm. There are still small publishers um, and... Online publishing, the way we did our book, was to do it online on demand. So if someone orders a book, it, one book gets printed. And That's changed. A, That's a revolution. Changed everything because anyone can be an author now, right? So, But people uh, have been talking about the death of uh, the novel and the death of uh, writing for, for decades and decades. I mean, that was... Every uh, word has been written. Uh, or, no well, well, I mean... <laughs> yes, every painting has been painted. Uh, it was, every song has been sung. <laughs> I, I, well, right. I mean, that was Gore Vidal's big complaint in the post-war period. He said that everybody became a journalist. Capote is a journalist and Mailer becomes a journalist. They just tell these sort of journalistic stories. They're not really novels. They're just right. works of journalism. And yeah. but I mean, series just, of essays with chapter numbers. On. <clears throat> yeah, it was one of the one of the many complaints. Uh, Gore Vidal was upset about many things, which I yes, enjoyed. Um, uh, and in fact, Voltaire, when talking about uh, Cicero's De Officiis, uh, which was written in 44 BC, uh, Voltaire said, "No one will ever write anything more wise." There you go. Well, that's a question. How do they know what he? It was written in 44 BC. Mm. Was it a book? How, I mean, it how do we know that's what he said? It was a book. Uh, it was actually it was a it was a scroll, I guess. A papyrus, his, perhaps, his, or his, a parchment. I think it was. Uh, I think it vellum. was vellum. Vellum, yeah, calfskin, and uh, it was actually written down by his freed slave, who uh, wrote it down, and then it was copied and copied and then it became then books were invented you know the scroll and then the uh, then the Gutenberg press doing, right and then, well, then yeah l- movable way type. later yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah because most of the most as you say most of the books or most of the writings from that time from that era most of them disappeared you know because they're in the 
library at Alexandria. <laughs> well, yeah, they, things deteriorate. Burned oh, the, down. And, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls we still have. And those Cicero was copied so many times, he, he just happened to survive. And then, uh, then the monks started making books, and so it survived on down to this day. But uh, the uh, – so – um, he, this author is saying, oh, there's a great quote. Books are not just tree flakes encased in dead cow. That was said by a <laughs> well, C- Cicero, uh, Cicero, MIT scholar. Cicero famously had his hands cut off, and they were presented uh, oh, to, the, to the Senate. Uh, Everyone's a critic. Well, in the age <laughs> yes. of uh, – uh, To prove you could never write again. Do people like read death. is the question. Ah, well, that's the thing. People do. I was talking to a fellow uh, just now at the Palace Market, and he said that um, he was <coughs> observed reading by one of his coworkers, and uh, and the coworker said, "I can't stand reading. You know, it would be awful right. just to read all day." He said, "Well, don't read all day. Just read a little bit." And uh, but it was just that disappointment with reading, and it reminded me of the the perspective of uh, Sheldon Wolin, uh, what he called inverted totalitarianism, where in the United States you don't have to ban books because nobody will read them. <laughs> well, I, I'm <laughs> thinking of children, uh, young adults uh, in particular, ah. because uh, number one, books are expensive; they become very expensive. So uh, if you uh, hmm. if you're not capitalized, I mean, twenty five dollars for. Uh, for something that for a mainstream yeah, book, yeah, that's right. But, so, what did you? I mean, what about books that made an impression on you? By the way, do call six six three eight four nine two. Books that made an impression on you when you were young. Can you think of the? Oh, when I was young. Oh, how young? Let's see. Fifties. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll tell you a book I'm that's rereading right bro. now. I'm rereading a book called the uh, the story of the white ant. Oh. It's about termites, the kind that, you know, grow in these huge termite mounds. Right. There is a very sophisticated society, and uh, it's, a, it's a dark world, whereas the bees are, you know, they're, they enjoy the light. Mm. Well, these turbines, the white ant, they're uh, subterranean. Mm-hmm. So it's and, – and a society that's very different because of that. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying that book. So this is oh. a non- – are you a, an avid nonfiction reader? There are people no, who I'm eschew not. fiction. No. Are, you an, are you a fiction eschewer? I, I, I used to read <laughs> fiction. Well, I did read a work of fiction uh, recently. But, but yeah, it's, since I was in my – since my 20s, I don't read very much fiction anymore. Mm. I read nonfiction mostly. Um, I'm reading a lot of detective uh, uh, so one of these termites is a detective. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to be a picture book lover myself. I'm very picture visual. I say, oh, I say. Well, can you think very of a picture good. book that made a profound impact? You're an artist. Yes. Well, this uh, one book in particular, as soon as I cracked it open, uh, I fell in love mm. with the images. And it was a, f- a book of photography mm. by a photographer named Julia Margaret Cameron. Oh. And... Yeah. Um, it just, I, I just had this immediate vis- visceral sensation in my body when I was looking at these images. Hmm. And is, is a, a young woman? She was. No, uh, no. When, when did you encounter the book? Oh, um, <clears throat> it, I was probably in my early thirties. Mm. Huh. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember there were two coffee table books, uh, Elliot Porter's Photographs of Maine, and then another photographer, his name escapes me, a Frenchman, who did a series of photographs of the Sahara, which I thought were just wild as, hmm. as a child, looking at images of the Sahara. It was, ooh, what, you know, how, what a radically different place than Flint, Michigan. Does, do you remember <clears throat> Peter Beard and his uh, photographs? And the, I remember a picture of him inside of an alligator. He was a, he was a real adventurer. A r- an inside, inside an alligator. And, and, <laughs> co- and connected to uh, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy. I think he was somehow. Oh, poor right fellow. There. When I was a kid uh, in school, I I was good at reading, but there was – maybe I was a little dyslexic and, mm. I didn't, you know, nobody picked up on it. Mm. But it just took me a little longer to get through. Uh, I'm the kind of person I read a page and I get to the bottom and I go, wait a minute. What, what just happened? I, <laughs> I got to go back, you know. So, like, my mind would drift right. while I'm reading, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when yeah. I was a young adult, uh, my dad introduced me to uh, Richard Brodigan. Oh. oh. And Topped himself in Bellinas. <laughs> I really oh, fell in love with his work. And, and mm. really, that was a period in my life where I really enjoyed to sit down and, yeah. and read a book. Lovely. Yeah. We have a caller. Caller, you're on the air. What's your name, please? Good 
Good morning, everybody. It's MK. MK. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Very Hi. well. Oh, well. Yes, it's um, a beautiful day. I am looking at my bookcase right now. I've gone had a big purge recently huh? and got, through, got rid of a whole bunch of stuff that I wasn't reading. And what remains <clears throat> is um, a lot of my dad's books from when he was a little kid, a lot of the... Um, Howard Pyle illustrated books and <laughs> NCYS and and those kind of things and uh, children's books from a long bygone age, mm-hmm. which hold up remarkably well. Oh. yes, children's books they're worth keeping for sure. And um, and the yeah. illustrations, a book like The Wonder Clock. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but mm-hmm. it's got a story for each each hour of the day and the mm-hmm. illustrations are by Howard Pyle who was a wonderful illustrator I don't and know. Arthur, Arthur Rackham's another one. Oh, Arthur oh Rackham. yeah. yeah. Well, and so N.C. Oh. Wyeth, he's be doing Treasure Island or something like that. Right, Treasure Island and, and a whole, and Robin Hood and and uh, all of those. And I actually read some of them to my to my uh, granddaughter and the language is quite archaic but it's it's she loved it. I mean, she just was wrapped. It was. I was fascinated by her reaction to it. Nice, and and that involved looking at the illustrations as well, or was she? That's, was it more uh, the yeah, story? That, yeah, sure, that too. But the stories. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Robin Hood. She was into Robin Hood for a while there. <laughs> and you know, otherwise, I've got all my dad's Updike, and I've got um, her Haruki Murakami stuff and stuff that I like, and um, go and read in the summer when I'm. At the end of the day, my brain needs a rest. Around mm. the world with Donnie Mame. That's another one. <laughs> 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 Patrick Dennis. Um, Do you use books uh, to take up time uh, when you're waiting for something or when you're alone in a, a, a cafe, something like that? I, I find that I use books as a, uh, you know, I don't like sitting by myself. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, book, books are wonderful. I, I listen to books on tape when I'm doing a lot of hand work and my hands are busy. Mm-hmm. Stuff like I listen to um, Dracula and, and and the original and and just stuff that I find at the library that I wouldn't otherwise pick up and read because <clears throat> there's too many words <clears throat> for my poor little brain. <laughs> but I'm just yes. listening to them. Well, audio books are certainly a, a new form of, uh, although... There, were, there have always been readings. It's just that we can now carry them around with us. But, uh, when, I was, when I was living in Hawaii, I, I was co- um, contracted by Susie Buell to make a Hillary Clinton person. I was making cloth people at that point. Oh, yeah. And so I, I made a Hillary Clinton person, and while I was making it, I listened to her book on tape. So I was sort of really immersed in Hillary for a while. Uh-huh. It was quite a, quite a long time ago, but that was a good experience for me to... Hmm. I you know I waver as far as politically, but um, anyway, that's my thing. Read on, folks. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, <laughs> books are still alive. Yes, they are. Also, I have Gone with the Wind. I have a whole bunch of weird. Oh things. my goodness! The You're classics. Flying. <laughs> I use them as, as a what is the word soporific 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 yeah. 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 Put you to sleep. oh they put you right to sleep at night mm. me yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tired get in there open the book and very naughty you yeah. find it flipped over on the floor in the morning right at the page exactly. where you left off when it falls out of your hand then time to go to bed <laughs> it falls on the cat and the cat it's too late over. now right <laughs> hmm. okay well, well thank you people and we'll um, I'm having fun listening to you guys Thank you, Thanks MK. Thanks for calling. Okay, bye. bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat> well, I think to Stephen's point, uh, Roland Barthes, but Paul always likes when I reference the philosopher who made the point. He thinks that's the best part. <laughs> Roland Barthes made the observation about the difference between readerly and writerly texts. And so the readerly texts, all the truths are sort of self-contained. They don't it, – it doesn't um, – identify any sort of larger truth in reality. It, it, it's just, you know, uh, 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 a, a world completely unto itself. So I would think of that be like P.G. Woodhouse, right? Like Jeeves and Worcester stories I loved reading. Uh, mm. And perfect thing for being on a beach or whatever. It's just a, sure. But it, it, nothing that occurs in that world that you enter through by reading it draws you out into a sort of larger understanding of the truth or reality. Just the opposite. It's nuts. <laughs> uh, so the, the writerly text, he says, it does the opposite. It it it, it actually. 
Uh, and the, these are the books that are very difficult to read. I remember throwing books across the room and you know being very upset mm. because they draw you into a larger truth. Mm. They do actually uh, um, expose you in a way and, and, and make you think about or contemplate things that are difficult or new or whatever and relate to the, the reality that we, you actually inhabit. They're not mm. self-contained. Mm. So, and that's hard. It's very hard to read books like that. Um, but we have a caller. You have a caller. Hi, caller. What you're on the air? What's your name, please? Sally. Sally. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good morning, one and all. Good, Good day. morning. Um, first of all, to tie everything back to pop culture, which apparently is what I do, <laughs> um, a really great list of books is David Bowie's favorite 100 books, and you oh. can. Uh -huh. Search for that online. Just, just type in David Bowie's favorite books. Yeah, oh, interesting. He was exceedingly well read, hmm. read voraciously. And my favorite book is one of his 100 favorite books, which is Night at the Circus by Angela Carter, a British author. Hmm. And so that, that was. That brought me closer to my one of my music musical idols. Uh, reading that list, that's and unusual too. Yeah, putting out a list. Well, I, well, I like this um, Errol Morris's celebrity list, which is I think uh, would Sally would approve with the level of, of pop culture and kitsch going on here. One of my favorites and Errol Morris's favorite books is Letters to Strongheart. Letters to Strong, forty letters written to a dead dog. Strongheart was uh -huh. one of the first animal movie stars pre Rin Tin Tin. He was a screen legend. In Brawn of the North, there is a close up in which Strongheart <laughs> cries following the death of his master. Oh. Uh, <laughs> woe to the one who believes the, those weren't real tears. Um, so I thought no one else knew about this book. But anyway, uh, Errol Morris recommends Letters to Strongheart, a man letters who, who wrote 40 letters to a dead screen idol dog. Screen dog. Oh, yeah. oh that's lovely. Uh. <laughs> on, on that, on that, in that vein, hmm. there is uh, a screening tonight at Ink Paper Plate. This is a plug, but it ties into your show, I promise. Uh -huh. so Paul's uh, trying to sell his books. You're trying to. What is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm trying to sell my books too. So come on down to my house tomorrow. And anyway, uh, not tomorrow, Saturday. Don't come tomorrow. It'll be just so wrong. Uh, <laughs> there is a screening an ink paper plate in downtown Point Ray Station, which is a wonderful art studio uh, in town and a general meeting place, a salon, if you will. A salon. Uh, a wonderful film called In a Lonely Place, which stars Humphrey Bogart and Gloria Graham. Mm. And this film came from a book which was written by Dorothy Hughes of the same name, In a Lonely Place. And I read the book a number of years ago, and I, it, it, it was shockingly brutal. Mm. And very different. I mean, the film the film is uh, difficult enough for a Hollywood noir because it's a kind of a doomed relationship. Uh, but this book is tough, and uh, I kind of it kind of brought to mind for me a couple of female authors who are such tough writers. Like, um, what do you mean by to, tough? Well, they, like they write to me, they write such uh, uh, intense, threatening, dangerous male characters mm. as the as the you know the protagonist or the with with the fatal flaw. Uh, the first the the female author who most comes to mind is Patricia Highsmith. Oh yeah, who wrote the Ripley. Right. Ooh, the talented Ripley. Mr. Ripley. I can't, I can't even read those. <laughs> Well, that's what I mean. Well, maybe I, maybe I don't know what you mean. Actually, it makes me too um, unsettled. E exactly. Oh, well, therefore they shouldn't be allowed in libraries or in <laughs> school curriculum. You've but, triggered Stephen. Oh, yeah, too unsettling for me. No, but that's the thing. She's very cold. Her style is very cold, and uh, matter of fact, and uh, sort of uh, she t she kind of takes the prisoners, and her characters are. She, she, she's not that generous with those characters, you know. 
And it's, it's interesting. And this Dorothy Hughes book is really upsetting. Well, if you really want to get upset, these. In a Lonely Place by Dorothy Hughes. No, I think I might take a look at that one. Top of the reading list. I like noir. You know, it's it's like a little pulp paperback. I mean, Hmm. you want to read it, and then you're kind of sort of upset that you read it. (laughs) All the people are damaged. You know, speaking uh, of that, uh, anti-heroes. The, uh, what is it? Uh, There were a lot of really good books that came out in, in the 40s, paperback. Uh, not, you know, not advertised, not recognized, mm. and I'm trying to think of the Mar- Mary Fuller McChesney, <clears throat> who may still be in a retirement home on B Street in Petaluma, uh, wrote Pulp uh, Erotica. Not that, <laughs> fru- not that Froofy Anias Nin stuff, but, you know, the, the pulpy, goofy. The pulpy stuff. Oh, the best. I and think it was called The Black <clears throat> Lizard. The Black yes, the bla- yes. Yes, oh. yes, I have them. I have several. Really good, <laughs> really good. Yeah, and in fact, I'm not selling those, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them were made into movies. Never the Black Lizard. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Many the of Black them Lizard movies. We're talking about Jim Thompson, uh. the king of those kinds of pulp noir books um, uh, of that era. He he wrote The Getaway. He wrote. Um, Nothing more than murder. He wrote. Well, the Getaway is the most famous book that was turned into a film. I'll try and find uh, it. Mm. And uh, yes, uh, he wrote. He wrote many, many books. And the, and Black Lizard, Lizard is no longer in existence. I think Barry Gifford was one of the people that ran that press. Oh, uh, oh it was a press. Uh, uh. I, I have several of those those paperback books, but you can get Jim Thompson's books on. Uh, I mean, they've. They're, they've been republished. It's very reliable. You see a black lizard, and you know uh, he'll take the chance with it. Yeah, David Goodis, <laughs> I think, is another one of those writers. I love that. I love that stuff. It's just gritty and yeah. fast, yeah. and then you just sort of go, you kind of gnash your teeth, and you say to yourself, ah, who are these terrible people? <laughs> and, and then you realize they've all... M- Sorry, I Uh-oh. almost had a collision because no, no, no. Who are you? Oh. I'm I'm hands free, but the lady just tried to move into my lane. Uh, not the topic for a book, by the way. What, uh, but what about the uh, <laughs> unusual celebrity uh, uh, genre, which is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Tony Curtis wrote a uh, book, uh, which I once saw. There was a, 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 a an instance of oral sex, but in, within three pages uh, of, of uh, Tony Curtis's fantastic, uh, uh, white classy. Do all those people write their own books, or are they ghostwritten? Like, That's a good but question. The thing is, but like, there's like a name dropping tome written by. Uh, Michael Caine, where all he does is say things like, "Oh no, I met, I met Goldie Dolls," and you know, <laughs> and it just Goldie goes Dolls. on and on with all the people he met. Small group was lovely. Well, the, but those are bi- but that's like an autobiography. In this case, yeah. you, like I, th- I sort of have to think Tony Curtis did write that, or at least dictate it. But then you both, uh, Sally and Paul, know my favorite, mostly because of the review. I've never actually read the book, which would be <laughs> Fantan by Marlon Brando uh, oh, and dear. and Donald Camel, uh, who Sally would know from the film world certainly. The uh, co-director of. Performance. Yep. Along. Wow. Yeah. There, I see. And it's Boy, encyclopedic you, knowledge. What a mind, yeah. See, Sally is realize. a walking encyclopedia. I didn't here, realize but. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it, totally insane, and I and I, I sort of believe that Marlon Brando wrote the book. Again, a lot of unusual sex acts, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like you know, for no apparent reason. For no apparent reasons. Um, uh, so uh, these as, are these are novels written. Yeah, no. that are written by actors. Mm. Interesting. Uh, as a part of the review, uh, it has, quote, with loads of daring do about bloodthirsty pirates, unscrupulous warlords, picturesque horrors, incorruptible Sikh security guards, and aphrodisiacal, uh, aphrodisiacal uh, how do you say that? Aphrodisiacal, yeah. uh, aphrodisiacal uh, minerals. Uh, Fantan is nothing if not a ripping yarn. Wow. Uh, so 
Uh, as the novel opens in 1927, a portly, dissolute, middle-aged Scottish-American sea captain with the unlikely Dude. name of Annie Doltry is serving out a six-month prison sentence for gun running in a forlorn Hong Kong prison. Marking the days, he amuses himself by arranging cockroach races, balancing a tea mug on, quote, the great hairy pompous of his chest, unquote, <laughs> and, and ruminating. <laughs> and so ru- this no. is a fantan by Marlon Brando. Everyone rush out and buy that. Just like read that. the review of the New York Times from 2005. I read it in print. I, I don't know, for whatever reason, Fabulous. I was getting the Times make it, and just cr- died laughing. Does opening paragraphs of a book count? I mean, can you just well, look at the opening paragraph? Here's, and one, here's one from my my teenage years. Someone brought this book to school. It was called Wheels of Terror. See, I remember the name of it. And the first three words were, Lulu slept naked. Oh, <laughs> Wheels Uh-oh. of Terror. Uh oh. It, it got you. It was. It, it, Tony Curtis waited to page three for that. You know, you know the fool. But I'll leave you okay. with Vladimir Nabokov's oh, opening ooh. line to Lolita, which mm. is the best opening line. Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins. Yes. <laughs> good gracious. But that's good a old, you, And goodbye. Thank no, you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, but that's an amazing book. You know, I really, you think you're like, are sick of prose, you know, stylists, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. You know, I've sort of gone through a lot of the Western canon. And then you find Nabokov, you're like, ooh, wow, somebody can do something new with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, 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 he was really a wonderful discovery. Give us a call, won't you? 415-663-8492. And uh, talk about books for a while. You know, I hang out at the Novato <laughs> Library. And it's a, I thought you weren't allowed to do that place. anymore. I thought there was a protective... <laughs> uh, what you say, no, that's dollars. stalking. Oh, I say, I, oh, You're God. allowed to hang out there. Would it's a like busy this place. children's book? <laughs> yes, well, this is the thing. Libraries. Uh, uh, Murray Seward was uh, was kind enough to write in because he received the blurb, and he said, "Well, browsing, uh, you know, browsing in bookstores may you may not find the the surprising things that you used to, except here in Point Reyes Books because they mm. have used books as well. So, you know, but." Um, you you may not find the little gems that you weren't even looking for, but libraries, of course, have those little gems. That's why. But they'll search for you as well. Yeah. If it isn't in there. Yeah. yeah. But back to Errol Morris's list of favorite books. Errol Morris has uh, a love of really horrifying self help. <laughs> so he, he recommends How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. And he oh, yes. describes it thus. Uh, I bet you thought I was going to mention the other one, a pale comparison to this work of genius. I dare anyone to read it without an immediate and overwhelming desire to open up your veins in the tub. <laughs> it, has, oh. it has perhaps my favorite poem, although I have to confess uh, a fondness for the poetry of Yeats, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Blake. Here's the poem. Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw sand, the other stars. Uh, and Right. So, so it, it, uh, actually, I this is a f- fun thing to do at libraries. If you go to the library, uh, say the Inverness Library, it has uh, all of the things that people have requested by name on a on a cart. You can see what everybody's reading. Uh, and I don't uh, think you're allowed to do that. Well, allowed. He's a not sly allowed. devil. But well, anyway, I <laughs> I would just like to say somebody got a Dale Carnegie book uh, recently, and I talked to your mother the other day, and I may be coming over on Monday, so we're going to have to sit down. <laughs> about why you're reading oh, Dale boy. Carnegie. You know, that's interesting because <laughs> libraries expunge your list. Do they? Doesn't yes, the NSA they do. just get it? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, they, nobody they can really look up and find what you've been reading. Even Before or after they send it to the FBI? I mean, at what point? Hmm? Even now with uh, Ab- digital data? Abs- well, I don't know about that, but uh, I went back. There was, there was, oh, I want to remember the name. I said, oh, I'll just go look it up. Right. It wasn't, wasn't there. there. Uh, well, so here we are. On Let's Talk, call in radio. Give us a call, 415-663-8492. And this is KWMR, 90.5 in Point Race Station, 89.9 if you're going down to Bellinas, and 92.3 if you're going over the hill to San Geronimo Valley. And we stream everywhere throughout the world on kwmr.org. And we are supported by Art Rogers Photography in Point Reyes Station, helping the coastal community tell stories since 1973 through portraits of families, babies, groups, marriages, milestones, agriculture, and landscapes, as well as through the Yesterday and Today series, which features family portraits captured over a span of time. More information at 415-663-8345 or at artrogers.com. 
com. And we're also supported by To Celebrate Life Breast Cancer Foundation, raising funds to help underserved women and men living with breast cancer. Through its Bay Area Breast Cancer Grants Program, the foundation supports nonprofits that provide direct and emergency services and believes that no one should face breast cancer alone. Information about how to get involved is available at tocelebratelife.org. That's all. We only have two underwriters for the half hour spot. Well, mm, well so I, I, uh, <coughs> books. The last novel I read uh, was Submission by Michelle Welbeck. Uh, Welbeck has been described in the French media as a nihilist, misogynist, sexist, fascist, uh, racist. Uh, uh, many times, whoa. me and Mark Laveau love that book. Your conf- and, uh, is that a we, confession? Uh, we, right up your alley. He, he's, he's very controversial. <laughs> but I, I, I think that, that that's overplayed. He deals in controversial uh, topics. And so, so it sounded inevitably. like uh, our president, actually. Uh, I don't think the president reads, but if he did, he might like Michelle Welbeck. No, he wouldn't. It's, he, it's, but I liked Welbeck's novels, and he's, he's won all the major, the Prix Goncourt, and the, I, I believe mm-hmm. there's a, a Playard edition, I think, I think, is there? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Of his book, maybe not. So, but he, he won all the major sort of French literary awards, and he's just very controversial. A little bit like Céline. I didn't like Céline as much, mm-hmm. uh, but... Um, uh, uh, but again, there would be a person who was, you know, accused of being a Nazi and this and that. The other thing, you know, I, I don't know that the uh, morality of the author is really very interesting. Hmm. Um, it's what they do with language. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I, th- I don't, you know, so it's not. It doesn't. It, I think it's good to know. I think it's good to contextualize the life of the, whatever the person you're, you're reading yeah. a novel. And the writer isn't necessarily uh, representing themselves or their own views. Exactly. In no, fiction, the, the idea sure, is inventing yeah. it, right? They're right. they're making something up, maybe. But I think that the other problem we have, of course, is just. I mean, who does read a, a lot anymore? I think very few people do. I don't read. Uh, no, I read material. magazines. I find that well, the New Yorker mm. takes up a lot of time. Yeah, I have those in the sauna, um, but I the, <laughs> the uh, sauna. The, the sauna, I believe, as the Finns pronounce it. I uh, uh, yeah, I I do what Steve does. I I read in bed, which is terrible because then that that lulls you. Every time you pick up a book after that, you go, <laughs> kind of go off to sleep. But I and I usually wake up in the middle of the night, like two or three in the morning, when I'm alone, and uh, and uh, read then. Interesting. Which so is what, good because I tend to retain it then, which is I I don't know why that would be. That's does any well mm. call us six six three eight four nine two? But can uh, other books that had a profound impact on you? I read. I was in detention in the summertime because I had so many detentions in high school that I had to actually go in the summertime and sit in the school because I was bad. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was eventually expelled from that high school, but you know they could have just <laughs> ended the suspense. Um, the um, uh, b- wow. but, uh, but that was a great time, and I think unemployment is fabulous too. You could really get time to read. I remember I was oh, yeah. um, unemployed. I'd read the uh, in jail. Yeah, oh, yeah in jail. I haven't tried that yet, but <laughs> who knows? Um, they have extensive libraries, don't they? In jail? I don't know, but Bulgakov's *The Master Margarita*. I remember being unemployed and reading that book, and it was fabulous. What a great book! Mm. And uh, um, you know, so it's oh oh. Do we have and to call uh, it? yes, and yeah. Well, I have several books that were my favorites when I was younger and some that I still enjoy now and again. Hello, caller. You're on the air. What's your name, please? Keep it clean. I'm autodidactic and uh, T.E. Lawrence's uh, 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 Seven Pillars of Wisdom and R.K. Massey's uh, uh, Castles of Steel uh, and Dreadnoughts. And then let's see uh, the one hero about T.E. Lawrence. A lot of these things... uh, would kind to help bring to the attention uh, circumstances that are contemporary right now. They're no secret, except um, people just don't like history. They don't have an attention mm. span. And I guess it's because of the Internet, but I also like the Internet. But it's a really razor's edge. One side is so tempting, insidiously tempting. And then, of course, there's the dark side. But um, being autodidactic, being having learning disabilities, the book is so very important. And I realized that I was never going to have anyone be a tutor except for myself. And the way you educate yourself is you, you do that. You do that by reading. And that's about 
as elementary as it is, and so I have my own library. And when mm. people talk about books, I go, I want to know. Uh, there's a contemporary book right now called The Bad ASS Librarians of Timbuktu, <laughs> and it's about a contemporary man from Timbuktu, who gathered all of these wonderful transcripts, uh, um, non-secular, and then uh, 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 orthodox, uh, you know, uh, things of the, uh, um, of the Islam philosophies, hmm. and then uh, all of the things that are happening contemporarily that are a result of the end of World War I that have brought us what's happening now in the Middle East, and these are just all books, libraries. Libraries, you go to the library, there's computers. There's hardly any books anymore. You go to this current library here in town, and you can buy $100 books for $2. Mm -hmm. And I do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, the seven, oh. oh, sorry. No, the, go the Seven Pillars of Wisdom has one of my favorite scenes. A lot of the, the uh, that book was used as the basis of the movie... Um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence. And please do your Alec Guinness impersonation. Now. <laughs> um, oh, oh. In Lawrence. Well, I, well, I, I love the Tony Quinn line, which is, um, uh, the Turks have paid me a golden treasure, but I'm poor because I'm a river to my people. <laughs> um, nobody believes it when I say it. The, um, anyway, so the, in, in the movie, you know, uh, Peter O'Toole is riding around screaming things like, no prisoners. In the book, uh, this is not Lawrence's actual account of what he was doing. They they um, set off a bomb and blow up a train. It's the scene mm. that's in the movie, mm. and then they run to attack the Turkish troops that are on the train. And while they're running, his battle cry was, and I quote, "Oh how I wish this hadn't happened," <laughs> because they were all injured in the explosion as well, and now they're in this insane fight oh, to the death. Yeah. And oh how I wish this hadn't happened. One of my favorite scenes. I think uh, George Bush is saying that to himself. Uh, do you, I, the seven pillars of wisdom. Do you think that's uh, no? Oh, I wish this had never happened. <laughs> well, he's kind of a dope, yeah, I suppose. Well, but, George, but that was a beautiful. We, and that, we yearn for him now, don't we? Well, we've made our peace with him. Uh, I think the Obamas get have dinner what with those people on a regular was. basis. Well, there's a whole genre of things that you would never read, which is books that politicians put out about themselves, which I do not believe that they write. But mm. Ulysses S. Grant's memoir is one of the great um, works of uh, American you know, writing. Uh, and so I, I heartily recommend to, uh, that to him, his reflections on the Civil War. And he said the Mexican-American War was so cruel and wicked. It's the reason why California is ours. Ha <laughs> ha! Um, um, that uh, the Civil War was divine uh, retribution or justice for how, how uh, cruelly the Americans had treated the Mexicans mm. and stole their beloved state. You know, uh, Trump is always talking about the art of the deal, which he did not write. Something else. And he keeps, he refers to it as, as evidence of what a dealer he is. <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm, really, I'm the best, really. <laughs> and Coley, you're on the air. What's your name, please? Oh, this is Otto once again. Uh, you're hey, to me by talking about Ulysses S. Grant. That's a Michael Corda book, and he wrote the book. Uh, no, this is Grant's memoir. A hero, a hero about uh, um, T. E. Lawrence, and um, very insightful, very peculiar. Certain instances, um, uh, some I, I mean, he he pur purported to be working class, but he wasn't. But it goes back to the lineage of how he became a Lawrence, and his father was really a Chapman, and uh -huh. he took the name of his mistress's. Uh, uh, um, last name, and she was an illiter illiter illiterate child, uh, hmm. uh, Scottish, you know, and so it's so very, uh, this tapestry that's woven, uh, but uh, T.E. Lawrence uh, was not a military man, but he was a genius at killing people, and <laughs> that is true in that movie, that movie is very far removed, but what he did say was when asked by Allenby, uh, he discovered there was something that he didn't like about killing. And uh, Allenby said, what was that? And he says, I like it. Oh. Hey. Well, there you go. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Otto. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, but I got that book, a used bookstore in Hudson, New York, um, uh, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and it's, mm-hmm. a good, it's a good read. I mean, all of them are. There's a certain amount, not with casual reading, not with the readerly text, to bring back a philosophy, uh. Uh, uh, the, uh, is, is it's difficult because you're really taking on the voice of the author. It's as, this voice well, is now living you're in You're entering head. another world. If it's written well, you're yeah. actually immersed in this other world. That's right, and it's, it's like your, your stream of consciousness. To this is a voice that you're letting into your head. So I, I always found it was very. It could be very um, frightening is probably the wrong word, but I had a very strong ambivalence about entering into something. And then once you're into it, well, then you know you go through that book in a minute, and, mm. and you know you, you you inhabit it. And but it's scary because it's difficult. You have to be very selective about the voices you're going to allow mm. in at your <laughs> head, so like. to speak. Bowls. I'm I'm curious yeah. about uh, people who use uh, devices it. like Kindle to read. Yeah. Um, and what that's like, what that experience is like for them. I don't. Mm. I don't. I'm not well, one of was, them. It was. It was touted. You know, e-books are touted as oh, the books are dying. Books are dead. The Kindle, you just take it with you. You slip it in your pocket. Well, you can take it on the plane. But you're reading this. Weird. I mean, you can change the the font and you can highlight things and you can do all that, but it's this screen yeah, thing. It's that's a, it. right. It's just something. And I wonder if that's that... if that's if you know the younger the younger folks. I wonder if they feel the same <laughs> oh. way because you know us old folks. Well, yeah, it'd be great to... if if somebody under thirty could call in. You yeah, know? where would you find them? Why aren't they? <laughs> why aren't they at work? <laughs> exactly. Listening uh, to the radio. But that, that was yeah. This. Uh, but yeah, like they put the bookmarker in there, you know, and you can see how much you've read and how much you oh, have left. And, and it's you nice. can reread to catch up. And for us bed readers, you don't want and to have book... that light right there in, in your eyes when yeah, you're reading. Yeah, and book covers are so cool. Book mm-hmm. covers. Uh, the much ballyhooed decline of the physical book has been far from fatal. I thought everything was going to change so much more quickly and so much more radically, said a chief digital officer at Simon & Schuster. Yeah. Uh, they now expect most of their sales to remain in print books for decades to come, some say forever. There are a number of reasons. One is that as uh, Amazon, the guy who oversees Amazon's Kindle business... He put it, the print book is a really competitive technology. (laughs) It's portable, hard to break, it has high-resolution pages and a long battery life. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, and the author can't sign the Kindle. And you you can... If you wanted to... You can give them away, and you can give them to libraries, and you can take them to used bookstores, and they they carry on. Or you can leave them on a park bench. I've done that before. You just... Yeah, or in the... Or at the uh, post office. Or you can lend them to Miguel Kuntz, who still owes me my copy of Tink Thompson's gun. Oh, calling someone. It has, it has an, an, an inscription Public. to me uh, in the book, and, and Miguel is holding this hostage probably as well, a that, doorstop. Or that's a thing, you know, loaning books or borrowing right. books. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to give it back, and then... You can't loan your kind. Well, I guess you could, but, you know. <laughs> But the uh, <laughs> sales of of e-readers are in decline. They're not uh, they're not popular anymore. Their well, they're, they're kinda, sales I, are going down. Yeah, I mean, is I that can a see flash. It. Uh, well, oh, yes, it, oh it is a flash. We oh, have a caller. Flash in the paint. Hello, you're caller. You're on the air. What's your name, please? Uh, this is Otto. One last time. Hey, Otto. This um, thing. Uh, I never lend books, CDs. Uh, he's uh, got a rule. Albums. Any of those things, because I, without exception, have never got them back, or have got them back used as a dinner plate or a. Oh. And so you have to put your foot down and say, "I'm not but, the library. The library's over." There you There's go. a well, preciousness, on a right? But, There's a preciousness. Otto, on when you, it, oh, it, when it hung up again. But I just when, when Otto <laughs> lent that book to that person, did the person actually ask for dinner plate? See, that could be the reason oh, why. But what about terrible. what about saving these books? At, uh, how about passing them on to somebody? I mean, I think it makes sense to lend books or give them away. Yeah, I'm giving them away. I'm, yeah. I well, have I have ten, books, uh, ten to... boxes of books My if dad, anyone wants them. My dad had an awesome collection <laughs> of theater books and yeah. scripts, you know, plays, and um, got them all donated to the this college where he taught mm. theater. Yeah, good. But I have a problem with it. It's probably, you know, like in college you'd get assigned reading and then I had such a problem with authority that I wouldn't do the reading and just the summer afterward I would read the books and be like, oh, this is really great. Why didn't I read this at the time? Because um, <laughs> you had to. Do, well, yeah, if somebody was telling you to do it, then my answer was definitely no. That's why, that's uh, why most 
kids used to, well, used to, I don't know if they still do it, they don't like Shakespeare because they were made to read it. But mm. if you if you do steal yourself and go back to it later, what incredible. Yeah, just, amazing. And the insults are great. Wow. I love when Hal calls Falstaff the globe of sinful continents. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so, but do you have that thing where somebody gives you a book, you go, ew. My mom. I'm oh. afraid, would give me a book, and I knew that, you know, she was trying to give me a message. Mm. And ah, I'm yeah. like, oh, sorry, Mom, not interested in your message right now. <laughs> <laughs> but finally one one pierced through, hmm. um, and I actually read it, and it, it made a difference in my what life. What was it? What was that? It was The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. Oh. Oh, well, we have to go back now. Errol Morris <laughs> also recommends a self-help book. It was on fire when I lay down on it by Robert Fulgham. What can I say? The titles are almost <laughs> the best part. He I also, know that. <laughs> you know this one? Yeah. He, he also wrote another one called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Yeah. Mm. I don't want to quibble with Mr. Fulgham, but I did learn a couple of things post-kindergarten that uh, may not have been essential <laughs> but proved to be valuable. Well, well you know, the, the seven thing, because when, yeah. when uh, Donna and I wrote Brain Lines, which was basically a person personality profiling system that we came up with uh we <laughs> bought all these books all these you know the and it's always seven seven steps and it was to awesome seven, because I that's could why we did seven brain lines one a day to focus on you know so i had like this whole system i worked i made cards and i put them on my refrigerator and then mm. i every day i would flip it and okay today i'm thinking about this and i'm going to try to activate it in my life and uh, yeah, so it's super convenient hmm. to have it packaged like that. Seven right. days, seven laws, seven days. Well, you know, exactly. I think it's it's difficult too, where it, you really need to have leisure in order to tackle a difficult book, and most people mm. don't have it. So people who are trying to advance themselves, all the worker bees, bzzz, all around, you know, they'll do the reading in college because they have to do it. Or if somebody says this is the important book you need to read, well, then they'll read that. But to really mm. give yourself the leisure to enter into this other. It's world. luxurious. It is luxurious. It very much. Like I said, I, when I was unemployed, I got through so many uh, Gogol novels and Bulgakov and all, and it was <laughs> fabulous. But you had to be willing to be broke, which I, uh, <laughs> a, a risk I take blithely. Uh, I, I, I'm a blight spirit when it comes to it. So I've gotten a lot of reading done in life, and could you buy me Financially lunch, broke, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but rich in reading that's, supply. That's right. Does anybody have a sandwich is all I'm asking. Um, in my car. I've got oh, excellent. Thank okay. you. But, uh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nice to know that this is uh, such a lovely, lively discussion because books are, uh, you know. What about bookstores? Books wonderful things. Really oh, good bookstores, bookstores are, are rare. I mean, well, they're, yeah, I mean, of here they're rare. Very, they're very, rare very fortunate here. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's like they're literally living on cat calendars and uh, and yeah, well, picture they have books. To. Yeah, they right. Have to. That's what you know sells. I mean, they're, they're yeah. uh, and you know, cat dressed up as Buddha. You know, um, uh, they have to do it. Well, how yeah, do you pay the rent? Is the, yeah, is exactly, the exactly uh, because of uh, you know the dreaded Amazon. Well, first of all, it was Barnes and Noble and those guys who are now out of business. Because can you apply that to? Our bookstore, though, I think we have a bookstore that's unusual. And- yes. Oh, it's unusual yeah. that it exists. It's lovely. Uh, you know. Um, tell you where there's a really unusual one. That's in Cedarville in Surprise Valley, Murdoch hey, County. Is this Michael not? Sykes. Oh, dear. Who used to be here and Sink, ran Sinking the Brown, Study, Brown Study Bookstore <laughs> in town. Anyway, uh, yes, bookstores are wonderful and uh, lovely to walk around, especially used bookstores, because, as I say, that's yeah. where you find the little gems. Libraries, you know, I don't, I can't remember the last time I was in a library. I'm sad to say. Oh dear, why yeah. don't I do that? I, I don't. don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know either. I think the the difficulty is a lot of the reading I do now is on the screen. I'm re- looking at mm. screens all the time and reading, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Mm. You do have access to all kinds of crazy articles and information you right. never would have read. Um, I have a neighbor just sent me an essay by. Um, uh, Max Weber, on, you know, and so you know, I would never have come across that right, right, just right. randomly. So, no, it's a wonderful thing. The internet is a wonderful fount of knowledge, full of information. Is the information library, right? It's the big library. How about getting in into a groove? You have this one author, and you just keep reading book after book. You mentioned Lewis Mumford. That happened to me. I just kept reading one Mumford book after the other. I mentioned Lewis Mumford weeks ago. That's impressive mm. memory there. No, I yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I got into 
into this yeah. Mumford thing. Well, I, when I was, in, I did that when I was younger with Mervyn Peake, a wonderful. Well, I, wonderful I read writer, all the Dan English Frontier writer. books. I can tell you that right now. Uh, Dan Frontier and Dan you know, Frontier. Yeah, they're children's books. But Nancy I read, I read Drew them all. Mysteries. Oh, I never read I, any of those. My oh. mom had them, and and so I got my hands. How on old those. were you when you read those? Elementary school. Mm. Hmm. So yeah. if you. Yeah, so I, that was one of the questions was, do you have a favorite author that you would always buy a book by them or, or lent, borrow a book by them? I did it with uh, Paul Bowles. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Richard can't Rodigan. get enough of that dark desert stuff. <laughs> well, and the Tunisian boys, you see, leaving Paul's place at all hours. It really, Paul had a, a, Bowles had a big impact. And who else? <laughs> Dylan Thomas, of course. I, re- I think mm. I've read every word he ever wrote. Uh, My mom always read us A Child's Christmas in Wales every yeah. year. Oh, it's, and, and, uh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, moist and many colored jelly babies, and a folded hat, and a, a tram conductor's cap, and a, <laughs> and a duck that made when you pressed it the most unduck like sound, a sort of mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow. There you go. There it is. Wow. There it is. Still in, it's in the flesh. Fantastic. Uh, Very impressive. The, yeah, well, there but you continue to pr- impress me. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Stephen. Oh, and uh, John Gardner. We were talking about John Gardner the other day. Yeah. Was, uh, Wonderful writer. Uh, one of my favorites is the the book he wrote. Uh, it was Beowulf, but done from the monster's point of view. Grendel's from point Grendel's of view. Grendel's point of view. So. <laughs> Who wonderful. are these blonde people? And it, he has this wonderful me. knack of having these central characters who are who are really world weary, and they're actually fighting the system, and and you get their uh, I don't know their. Uh, Nihilistic. That's and, uh, an interesting thing you bring up. This conversation between writers. Uh, someone writes something, and then they they change it a little bit and come up with a, uh, a, a a book that is tied to the first one, like you just mentioned. Well, right. Harold Bloom, uh, who's Mister Western Canon, the Sterling Professor of English at Yale. Um, he had a whole theory of this. I think <laughs> I'm going to get his theory wrong. Uh, he calls it creative misprision, and it's that. The development in uh, from this relationship between writers is actually how they misread each other, <laughs> how, they, how they get it wrong, oh, <laughs> and, and, and you know go off in another direction. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if that's true. Harold Bloom, if you're listening, please do give us a call four one five six six three eight four nine two or Leopold Bloom if you're in. Oh no, no he lo- no. Well, fair, fair enough. <laughs> he you know Bloom uh, Harold not, uh, not uh, Leo. Um, he loved Dickens. I've never read Dickens. Not a word. Really well, we you know English education. Of course, you had to read Dickens, you had to read Shakespeare. Uh, well, I got shaky, but I didn't get Dickens. I uh, and in French, we had to read uh, Albert Camus, which put me off Camus for a long time because we read one of his worst books, which was Antigone, the story of Antigone, which was a dreadful tale. Um, the Camus great. Yeah, uh, yeah, his yeah. last work, the myth of Sisyphus, I love. I would, uh, I would gladly go back to it. But uh, as I say, I usually just read at night now. That's a terrible thing. Well, a Camus line: "To mystify is to increase the misery of the world." I love that. Or to mislabel, <laughs> or whatever. Um, but then we have to talk about books as status objects. Because I see a lot of people who buy stuff just to have it on their coffee table or on a oh, shelf. Oh, coffee table book. Yeah, or just you know, it's 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 <clears throat> it's not about the content. It's about the form. It's how it looks. It's sure. how it, you know. Sure. It, um, and there's, it seems to me, a, a lot of that goes on. There's actually a, a woman here in West Marin who's getting a book deal because she has a very popular Instagram account. And so I, it's going to oh. be just a picture. It's just going to be a printout of an Instagram well, account? Well, this is or? the thing. So that's the wonderful thing about the web, even though it's created all kinds of problems for publishing. So that, certainly for newspapers and magazines, uh, the ones who are surviving are finding ways to do it. But uh, – uh, like Mark Dowie, his his most recent book, which was on the Haida and the the, it was like a handbook for uh, revolution, uh, sovereignty if, for for yeah, to reclaiming sovereignty for native peoples. Uh, wonderful book, and he did it through this subscription service. You signed up to buy it right. when it came out, and that gave him enough time and an, a, you know an infusion of cash to. Uh, 
that he knew he was going to sell this many books, and so it gave him time to finish it. And anyone can do this now. I mean, anyone, the, anyone could okay. be an author online. You, the on-demand but, publishing is a wonderful thing. It, you there's can, a lot of crap, but there's also but the thing like with Mark's gems deal is that become huge sellers of the. Uh, you know, but, terrible things like Fifty Shades of Grey. But. Well, but you know, but by the way, the first time I ever met Mark Dowie was at Mike Gale's birthday party, and I yeah. didn't have, had no idea who he was, and I lectured him about the decline of journalism for, <laughs> at length. Uh, he and Linda Peterson said she remembered that, she enjoyed it. So Mark is a co-founder of Mother Jones, I believe. He's had a long career. He's published a lot of books. That way of funding himself would maybe work for a Mark Dowie, who's a very yeah, extensive yeah, yeah. network. Sure. But I don't think that in terms of funding the arts, uh, like so many things, it's what's going to sell. So the this woman's Instagram well, account, that, that's what we're going to publish? I mean, my generation is filled with stupid effrontery, and so I wouldn't be terribly surprised. It would be representative. Well, there may be some lovely literary gems I heard in her well, well, Instagram account. How many books do you have to sell to be on the New York Times bestseller list? Oh, I think it's very I few. Know. Eight. But, see, you don't have – that's what most authors now are not doing it to – to make a living at it. And that's the, that's the way it used to be before the publishing houses came along. That publishing house thing was only a like brief the moment. 19th century it started, I think, maybe. Late 19th century. For, for 100 years, you could only get a book published through a publishing house, and they would you know, reject anything that they didn't like or if they didn't like you when you walked in. But there's a lot of and, self-publishing, And, uh, and self-publishing, bookstores won't, I think, still won't stock self-published books. But... That's where the internet comes in. So it's changed. It's changed back to the way it was. It used to be that authors, if they wanted to actually sell books, or if they just wanted to get their thoughts out, which was really why you write a book, right? You want to get your opinions or your story out there. Uh, you would have uh, salons. You'd have readings. You'd you'd you'd, uh, you'd have people kind of sponsor you. You'd have to find someone who would uh, support you for a little while, maybe, or you'd just do it in your off hours or after work. So it's all come back to that, really. It's come back full circle because now we have the technology where anyone can do it. If they have pamphlets, a, we need a new Thomas Paine to yeah, print pamphlets exactly. and, and pamphlets. distribute. Shows you the power that we have now. Is we're, exactly. We're oh, how can I forget the Scum Manifesto? Speaking of self-publishing, that would be Valerie <laughs> Solanus's. Uh, the, what was it? The Society for Cutting Up Men. The Scum Manifesto. Give that a read. Uh, for cutting up men. Anybody? Me too. Cut, um, cut up some men. How about the Urban Dictionary? Nobody remembers Valerie Charles. Uh, yes. oh, right. I have the Urban Dictionary of slang. And, yeah. You know, oh, Desaad, I also, I I also gotta say, have the, uh, the Cockney Bible. <laughs> Desaad, by the way, is his ultimate trick was, and there's like an orgy every four pages. Right. It's so bad. I don't know if it was just a translation. It is so boring. And I think that was Desaad's ultimate act of cruelty upon the world, that everyone would be interested in reading him, and it would be it horrible to do so. Uh, so, um, it's, yeah. That's not good. Well, this has been Let's Talk. Let's Talk Books this week. Uh, thank you for our callers. Thank you, everybody. Uh, KWMR does not take a stand on any of the issues discussed on Let's Talk. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the hosts and callers and don't necessarily reflect the views of KWMR, its board of directors, underwriters, or members. We'll be back next week with something. I don't know. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Shelley. Thank oh, you, Charles. Yes, thank you, Paul. You. Thank and, you, Otto. Uh, yeah, Otto. <laughs> and MK. And Otto. Sally. Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, let's have a little, a little music from Fairport Convention, the book song.